Okay, so great. I guess it's working. Uh, let us start. So, hi everybody. Great to see you here. Uh, my name is Mike Rocks. I'm currently a software engineer at uh, Yandex. It's uh, one of the large uh, IT companies in the Eastern Hemisphere. And uh, today I'm gonna give something special, a talk that I very much needed when I was a junior engineer without uh, actual development experience. Uh, the talk actually describing how to take your Java code that you would be writing in your IDE and actually make it look like a production code in a sense that there is a, a database that the code uh, can leverage in a sense that uh, it's not only in memory, in a sense that you can actually uh, use uh, curl requests, uh, that's a utility uh, to actually make web requests to your backend application. And uh, you can see the actual uh, code being executed line by line in a debugger. And the main idea is uh, that, uh, well, mo mostly in, uh, in courses in universities, not like MIT or Stanford, uh, you just are taught to code. The DevOps part of uh, coding is uh, not included. Uh, but at the actual job of a backend engineer, that's a very large part. That's a very big part, um, which uh, you have to do. And we will, uh, in our short time that we have, uh, we'll look uh, into how it is done on a surface level. Yeah, I need to ask a question. Uh, ha have you seen all of this, what I just said, like my cam, my mic, and the presentation, that the slide that I had? Uh, what, was it looking all right? Let's just have this uh, detour to understand that it's actually working and we're seeing that could somebody please write in chat if if if, if it was visible and uh, understandable somebody yeah great great thank you okay so uh what's this talk about why it's useful well as a java backend engineer uh you kind of do a lot of things. Uh, nowadays, the backend engineering field is uh, really uh, an all man's job, uh, like an all handyman's job in the sense that you have to write your code, you have to uh, probably deploy it, uh, maybe you have to work with Docker, Kubernetes, and generally the idea is uh, that <laughs> you're kind of hired to do it all if you're a backend engineer. Uh, well, times change, uh, the market is stiff right now, so it's useful to have a surface understanding of where does the code fit in this picture. Uh, so yeah, we'll see how to feed Java code that we have written in our text editor uh, into an actual running uh, application uh, on our local computer. Yeah, it's uh, useful for understanding distributed systems because uh, nowadays, uh, you would hardly find an application uh, in a big tech company or just a medium-sized company that would only have one running uh, instance uh, because uh, high load uh, is limited by uh, the actual capabilities of uh, one computer, uh, of uh, one CPU, uh, and uh, of uh, a one operating system. That's why usually you would have like uh, written code for one application, but uh, the application itself would be multiplied like uh, 10 or 100 or 1000 of times. Uh, the same code would be running on a thousand different machines uh, to handle the load that is given. Uh, yes, uh, the hands-on experience uh, in creating web application from zero, uh, we'll see uh, how it's done. Generally, we the, the idea is uh, to have just this empty Ubuntu operation system that I've just installed two hours ago and uh, to see what tools are uh, used uh, in uh, web development. Yeah, and generally in my experience, uh, the more senior a software engineer is, the more they uh, are self-sufficient in a sense of developing and actually releasing to production an entire feature. And releasing an entire feature uh, requires to understand how the backside of uh, your backend application works. Uh, so well, are you using Jenkins uh, for your CI CD? Uh, where are you deploying? Are you using AWS or are you using something else? And uh, generally, the surface uh, look at this uh, we will have in this talk. So uh, 
that's why, uh, as I said before, uh, I really needed such a talk when I was uh, a junior engineer, because uh, it really, it really works in in interviews uh, when uh, you have such a knowledge of how to actually not just write Java code, but how to deliver it to production. Yeah, so that's uh, a good career advice. Uh, dive deeper into how the actual running and deploying code works. And we'll see a bit of it uh, in this talk. So uh, the start of what we have is uh, just the Ubuntu operating system, which I'm running <laughs> right now, yeah, and installed it two hours ago. And uh, one other note is the beautiful template for content representations uh, that I was given, but I did not uh, get the notion that uh, the entire presentation should have been into it. So, uh, code mentor, your presentation is beautiful, but we're having a blank white text with uh, black black text uh, in this presentation. Uh, that's how just it is. So at the end of the talk, we will um, have uh, our text editor. We will have written the Java application. Uh, we have installed Docker. We will talk about what Docker is a bit later. Uh, we will have uh, two storage systems that uh, our Java application will be able to actually persist data into. It, it's called Postgres, it's called Redis. And, uh, uh, well, of course, our Java application will be connected to this Postgres and Redis. We will actually have the REST uh, API uh, in this simplified example. There will only be uh, two, handle, two handles. Uh, for getting uh, and creating one entity in the database. And we will actually launch the requests in our terminal. So uh, the general flow of uh, data will be, we'll have our terminal, we will write something in the terminal, and uh, it will get into the Java application. It will get persisted on our disk. Uh, and we will see how all of this uh, can be launched from like nothing, how we can get all of what is required for this cycle of backend development from the internet. Okay, so yeah, first things first, uh, about installing the uh, our text editor, which is called uh, IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, I have it installed right here, uh, and Docker. Uh, these are the only two things that we will need uh, to actually have our entire application. Uh, there are online tutorials for that. Uh, we only have the span of 45 minutes uh, for this talk. So uh, one important part is, uh, yeah, you should know how to Google. Uh, it's a very important, actually, actually very important uh, software engineering skill. Uh, now you have uh, things like ChatGPT, which you can ask questions and a lot of YouTube tutorials. Uh, so installing these two applications is as simple as installing Microsoft Word. Uh, if you're running it on Windows, you might have a bit more problems, uh, but generally uh, it's uh, beyond the uh, scope of the stock. Uh, we uh, will uh, skip installing uh, these uh, applications uh, and I have done that already. Yes, so as you've heard in my previous slide, uh, we will actually have Postgres and Redis uh, in our application and our Java application will be working with them. But the question is, uh, well, don't we actually need two other bullet points here about installing Postgres and installing Redis? Well, actually, no, uh, Docker. That's the solution to all of our problems about installing something. Let's see a bit more about how Docker works. So uh, Docker is uh, a system that launches containers. What is a container? Generally, you have uh, your computer here. Yes, it has your data on it. Uh, you probably have installed some applications uh, on it during your lifespan with your PC. And uh, generally, well, often we face the following problems. You are trying to install like a database and it just does not install. It just posts some errors and you do not do what you do not know what to do with it. Uh, well, uh, usually it happens on Windows, but actually can happen on any operating system. Like if you have CentOS, if you have Ubuntu, if you have macOS, like not all of the applications uh, are launchable on all of the systems simultaneously. So the point of Docker is to create, uh, let's call it mini computers, which uh, 
now have a guarantee that uh, Postgres and Redis would be successfully installed without any errors. Uh, more, I, I would want to add more to that. You can actually install uh, all the applications you want uh, without any uh, necessity for manual installation. So generally, you know, if you would want to install Postgres on your local PC, you would need to like open a browser. You would need to go to the uh, official uh, site. You would need to download the binary. You would need to click through in it, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, Docker, you install the Docker application itself once, and then it is very easy to actually install um, all of the other applications. You just have text files, which are called uh, Docker Compose files, uh, which you, don't, you just download these text files from the internet and the installation uh, goes by itself. Which is why uh, in the previous slide, as mentioned, we would only need to install our IDE, which is this like uh, actual uh, desktop application in which we write code and we install this Docker, uh, which is uh, 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 jack of all trades for all of the other applications we would need to install yeah uh, so at, at, at the current time are there any questions guys uh, if, if everything's clear we can move on uh, if you have any questions uh, please ask them right away uh, like in a minute i'll look in the chat again okay so uh, things are kind of clear right now we only need two applications like we need uh, the Ubuntu operation systems, which we have uh, installed clearly, and uh, th th there is nothing else in it. Like it has all of the like default Mozilla Firefox browser. Uh, we just need to install two applications, uh, and then we need some file, uh, some text file uh, to install Postgres and Redis. Uh, but right now, all that uh, we have done in our hypothetical scenario uh, is we have this uh, Ubuntu OS. We have watched uh, YouTube, two YouTube tutorials to install ID and Docker. And we have some insight into how uh, this Docker thing works. Okay, so uh, let's talk uh, a bit about what our Java application will need. Uh, what a generic web application needs? Well, it needs some way to get data. Uh, that is usually nowadays uh, done through the network, through, through the web, World Wide Web. And uh, in it, there are different ways to send information, but generally it just comes from online somewhere. It just comes through the network. So in our example, we will use uh, HTTP. Uh, and as you can see, uh, like this link has HTTP in it. So pretty much HTTPS, uh, but pretty much a similar protocol. It's just uh, a web request. So our, so our web application gets web requests and returns data through web means. And that's, that's the third thing. Um, second thing, we will actually need to do something with the, the data that is sent in point one. And for this, we will use plain Java, just code in Java. Uh, kind of important because uh, all of what is written right here, like we can substitute Java with Golang or with C++. Uh, and generally, uh, this is exactly how Java fits into the cycle of backend development. It is one of the tools to actually deliver web servers, to actually create web servers. Uh, OK, so well, that's clear. Uh, and uh, another thing I'd like to add, uh, an actual web application uh, can exist uh, with only these two first points. So uh, we can have an application that does, need, does not need any persistence. For example, uh, an only in-memory cache. Or for example, you can roll out an application that uh, counts Fibonacci numbers. And uh, it would not necessarily need to store anything persistently. Uh, so it wouldn't need a database. But uh, generally, in uh, modern backend development, uh, you have some kind of persistence. You have some ways to store data. And that's why we would need Postgres and Redis. Um, actually, you can deal just away only with Postgres uh, to actually store data. But that would be too simple of a talk uh, to give. Uh, that's why I actually introduced Redis as well. 
and we will have a, a slide about the differences of Postgres and Redis uh, down the line. Uh, so yeah, this drivers thing about uh, why why would Postgres and Redis need something else if we like have Docker if we have uh, uh, launched Postgres and Redis through them? Well, you see, um, Postgres and Redis uh, have different ways to be communicated with so it's not that you can uh, use uh, json files to uh, conversate with both postgres and redis and f the format of these json files would be different uh, that's why all of the logic uh, of how our application would communicate with postgres and or redis uh, it is abstracted right away into a thing called drivers uh, if you have like an NVIDIA graphics card or an ADM graphics card, and generally this word drivers uh, is uh, used when you have some hardware, for example, a v uh, graphics card like uh, GTX something, uh, and your PC, uh, your CPU would need to somehow communicate with this device. And hence the word driver, because it like drives the communication uh, towards this device. And say with Postgres and Redis, uh, you would have uh, some, for example, MongoDB, it would require its own mean of communication. For example, MongoDB would need to have its own uh, HTTP API. Uh, well, I don't know whether it does have or not, but what is certain is that it is some mean of communication. Uh, well, generally, this mean of communication could be abstracted away into a driver, and MongoDB does have a driver as well, as well as Postgres and Redis. Uh, and uh, the last point that we have here, uh, it actually stands apart uh, as uh, it is not some uh, necessity in a sense that it does not necessarily provide any new, never seen before functionality into our Java application. Uh, but it is uh, a bit of a more of a meta concept uh, of uh, actually understanding what your Java application does. So uh, I've seen some competitive programmers, uh, like people <laughs> who uh, solve red tasks on lead code in 15 minutes. And uh, generally, they uh, write, how do I politely say it? Uh, not quite a readable code. Uh, and like this is understandable. This is understandable in the sense uh, where you only need to use the code once for, for something, for example, for a school project. Uh, but in the actual practice, uh, there are actually two components to this. Uh, first one, the code that uh, you you write is used a lot of times and thousands and millions of times and users uh, like use it in different ways. And second, uh, this code needs to be extended over time, for example, over several years. And uh, if you write your code in a way that uh, only you and only when you are writing it understand it, uh, well, that becomes problematic. That's why actually you have things like code review. So uh, such problems do not occur. And uh, one of the ways to reduce the actual burden uh, of complexity on the code is uh, to simply have uh, std outs in the code. Well, that's the logging thing. It's pretty much uh, a way to write out what your code is, uh, what your code has in its memory right now, but uh, like in a succinct and uh, nice and uh, generally accepted way. And uh, in actual practice, you would have uh, different tools to actually read logs uh, faster. Uh, you would actually uh, have like uh, logs stored into, for example, a SQL database, and you would have an option to write a SQL query to uh, parse logs uh, that, for example, only the error logs. And uh, all of the written out things, the HTTP, uh, like the way to send data, HTTP, uh, the actual code, Java, the drivers and actual Postgres and Redis, we will have in our application. Uh, OK, so is everything clear for now? Yeah, uh, no questions in chat. So we can proceed. Uh, so how are we actually going to do this? How 
what tools are we going to use to actually have uh, our Java application responsive for HTTP requests? Uh, how would we communicate with Redis? How would we actually to uh, write our SQL queries to our SQL database Postgres? Uh, well, in Java world, there are uh, a multitude of technologies that uh, can be used for, for such purposes. Excuse me. Uh, but uh, one of the most commonly accepted uh, one is uh, the Spring family uh, of applications. And Spring, you can see here the logo of Spring Boot. This Spring part uh, is uh, a general name for a multitude of uh, already prepared solutions. Uh, they are called frameworks. They are called libraries. Uh, generally, all of this is not important. What's important is that uh, it is uh, a solved problem, like a solution to a common problem. For example, uh, being able to answer HTTP uh, requests. For example, being able to uh, go to the database and write a SQL query. Or for example, authenticate a user in the database uh, and uh, in the web application. Uh, and there are two ways about it. And I, I actually know uh, teams at Yandex uh, who uh, prepare, prefer to just write out all of this by themselves, uh, all of this code by themselves, all of this actual like tens of megabytes of production code that needs to work properly all of the time, uh, that uh, needs not to have bugs, and that actually requires time for maintenance, for constant maintenance. Uh, that's that's a one way about it. Uh, and another way is to use open source technologies, for example, Spring Boot, which we will use uh, in our Java application. Uh, Spring Boot is uh, very wide. It allows for a lot of things. Uh, but uh, what is interesting to us in the context of uh, this conversation is that it can accept HTTP requests. And uh, yeah, there was a slide before, which uh, one thing that is really important uh, to understand for people uh, who are just diving into actually uh, being able to develop applications to get job, jobs in IT as backend developers is not to get overwhelmed. That's why you can see I'm using a lot of layman's terms uh, in this conversation. And uh, we are not uh, going to talk about things like uh, authentication and uh, more in-depth concepts. We just really need to uh, see how we can actually have our Java code run as a web server. Yeah, so for the network kind of stuff, we will use the Spring Boot. Um, and uh, two and three are these drivers that I was talking about. Uh, like number two is just a driver for Redis, uh, which we almost not going to leverage in any way. It's just going to exist. Uh, for our application to uh, take advantage of and just to communicate with Redis. And uh, we would use uh, this Hibernate thing uh, just to write uh, SQL queries uh, to our database in our Java application. OK, so well, how do we get uh, Spring Boot? How do we get it like uh, for like for one second, like uh, let's just close all of it. And you see, like, it's just a, a it's just a Java application. There is, like, our sources. This is not important for a moment. Like, the Java folder, there are, like, some interfaces. There are some classes. Um, and, no, and none of it is called Spring Boot. Uh, how do we get it? Well, that's a, a very good question. Uh, there are things, like, all of these are dependencies, like, we know we need Spring Boot, so our project depends on Spring Boot. Uh, and we need a Redis driver and we need this Hibernate thing. But how do we get it? Do we just like go onto some site, look up the Java code for Spring Boot, we just download it and we just put it like, you know, somewhere as, as a new Java class and we call it like downloaded Spring Boot, something like that. Uh, <laughs> that's one way about it. Um, can say I know people who do that because there are solutions uh, to quickly and uh, very 
conveniently download all of this actual code that uh, runs Spring Boot. That, that like that that Spring Boot is represented by like the actual Java code like that is called Spring Boot. Uh, and for Java, the thing is called Maven. Uh, how it works? You know, you have Google Drive. You can have an image on, on a Google Drive. You can have a video. You can have uh, like whatever text there, or like or whatever file. Uh, you are this, uh, like this is you. Uh, this is somebody who uploads that uh, image in a sense, like a PNG image on a Google Drive, and then you can just download it from there, or maybe from Instagram. Oh, you can download from Instagram. Like I don't know whether you can download from Facebook. Okay, so Mega or like uh, Dropbox, you or somebody else downloads it there, and then it is, it is accessible through a link. And same thing with actual Java code. So uh, some Google devs uh, put some Java code onto this thing called Maven. And uh, then you just download it automatically. Uh, remember what I told you about Docker, that you can just write some uh, text and uh, all of the applications will be installed automatically. Uh, kind of the same thing with Maven. You just uh, write out uh, some text and all of this Java code gets downloaded automatically. And we'll see how it works. Actually, right now, because uh, this last slide, uh, we'll talk a bit about, about it a bit later. So this Maven thing, uh, you can see this letter M here. Uh, and what what do we have here? Like some text, generally some text. Uh, the form that it's written in is called XML, uh, which stands for extensible markup language. Or oh, extendable. Uh, but like none of it matters right now. We do not need to look at any of this not to get overwhelmed. Uh, what is important is that we have this uh, tag here called dependencies. And as I told before, our application will depend on Spring. Our application will depend on uh, ways to communicate with Redis and Postgres. Second. And uh, would you look at that? We have this uh, Spring word right here, like Spring Framework. Uh, this is uh, a, a part of a way to communicate with uh, uh, Postgres and SQL. And uh, like, you do not really need to dive deeper into what uh, is like what an actual artifact is right now. Uh, that's uh, a bit out of the scope of this conversation. So we have this Spring Boot Starter Web. This is the mean for us, for our application to accept uh, web requests, HTTP uh, in particular. And as you can see, like this Hibernate thing, we also do have it right here. Next, uh, there is this also a driver for Postgres. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this one, it says Redis. So it is it is the mean to uh, communicate with uh, Redis itself. So let's, uh, excuse me, uh, not what I wanted to open uh, for now. Let's look uh, at our actual uh, dependencies that we have, the Spring Boot thing. Uh, something related to Postgres, so that driver, uh, something related to Hibernate, and something related to Redis. So um, all of all of it we have described as a text in this Maven file. Uh, so we have this Maven window here. Um, and like if we refresh uh, the Maven dependencies, uh, they actually get downloaded. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see all of them in these external libraries. So, so for example, like you see a lot of spring spring things here. Let me just try to find Redis. Um, yeah, we have some Redis libraries here as well. Uh, Hibernate is here probably as well. Yeah, there are a couple of Hibernate lib libraries and probably Postgres uh, drivers here as well. Yeah. As you can see, uh, the important point is, is uh, like all of this, all, like all of these, like files, are jar files, like all of these are libraries. Imagine how horrible it would be if we had to download it manually. Good thing we have Maven. 
the Google Drive for Java libraries. Uh, and that's pretty much all what is there to say about Maven. Uh, we have uh, this list of what we need to download uh, as like written as text here, and it does so automatically. Yeah, so let me check if there are any questions at this point. How should we install the Ubuntu in our machines, uh, VM or dual boot? Uh, good question. Uh, the point about Ubuntu uh, that I've installed myself is uh, that uh, you can actually do all of these things on any operating system. For example, Windows. Uh, if you have Windows 11, that would be even simpler. Like Windows XP and Windows 7 might be more problematic, but you can still do that. Uh, Ubuntu is just open source and it's free. Most of it is free, and you like the free version is sufficient in that. If you have macOS, that also works for macOS. Like, remember, you you only need to download actually two applications. Where is it? Yeah, you need this IDE that is available for Linux, for Windows, for macOS, and uh, you need Docker, which is also available, well, <laughs> which is less available. But if you like have a modern PC, uh, you can download it as well. It totally works on all of the modern Mac OSs, uh, works on Windows 10 and 11. Uh, if, if, like, if you update like your Windows, it does work on, on the newer revisions of Windows 10. And uh, like all of the other Linux uh, distributors, uh, like unless you're talking like, you know, something not officially supported, uh, it would work on it as well. Uh, the point is uh, you can actually have this set up on any platform that you have and i just chose uh, ubuntu os uh, because uh, like i have all of this setup on my windows pc and i just wanted to go through this process uh, to show how little things you actually need on a freshly installed system yeah so uh, if you have your working pc uh, that's totally fine to install all of it uh, on it uh, and there shouldn't be any significant problems uh yeah, about the Maven icon. Uh, good question. Uh, what I've done is uh, I have uh, installed the... Uh, let, let me just show you. Uh, so uh, a bit of an insight on like, the simple tutorial on how to install this idea. Uh, IntelliJ idea, that's what we want. And uh, generally, like you just uh, click like the first link and... Uh, uh the like the download button and uh what i've downloaded i've downloaded the ultimate version so uh it's a, a 30 day days trial uh but uh, uh the community version uh, which is uh, uh yeah, accessible somewhere here yeah uh yeah this community edition uh has all of the functionality uh related to Maven as well uh it's probably just like you either need to download the plugin uh, or uh you just need to uh let me show you so if you have like a new project uh like uh, there would be like an a maven archetype there and you just uh, if you have a maven pom file in your project uh the IntelliJ idea should just catch, uh, catch on to that it does have that and uh, uh, you would be able to download the amount of dependencies for example like uh, let me um, let, let me add uh, some non-existing dependency that like currently is uh, not e e downloaded uh, like spring boot okay so this for example this one um, no, no, no. What I wanted to show you is, okay, so uh, doesn't work. Okay, my point, what I'm trying to show right now is, uh, like, the, the text there will be read. Uh, okay, Mongo de Maven. Yeah, let me show you right now. Good question. Good question. And uh, like. See, like this is a dependency, you can just copy it. Uh, it will not uh, be downloaded on my local PC. Uh, yeah, you see, it's red. So if I just like press 
alt and enter like there are ways to resolve this um yeah this is like uh, if you have like error dependency uh, you should do this you should have this uh maven uh button appear and like you see it's being downloaded uh if you still don't have that uh, the, the the simplest solution that i have right now is download this uh free version of uh, in, uh, of ultimate intellij idea uh and like <laughs> I'm pretty sure like the community version does have it somewhere like inside of it. Uh, Maven is a, is a very popular tool. Like mm, probably should just like look it up. Uh, currently I don't have like a quick answer to where to uh, find it. Uh, I almost certain in community version it is there and the ultimate version, the, there is a 30 day trial and it is there 100%. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, another question. Visualizer. Uh, I don't see this text. Wait, wait a second. Let me. Uh, 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 good questions. What Spring Initializer does? Uh, Spring Initializer is actually uh, start. Yeah, so this is the tool. Uh, what it does, it actually, it does not download anything. Uh, let me show you. So we add dependencies, for example, Postgres. Uh, we add dependencies, Redis. Um, and we generate it. Yeah, so uh, we, we have downloaded this demo file. Uh, what you see here is... Uh, Okay, so it's uh, it's great. For example, wait a second. Uh, let, let me get it into Maven. Yeah. So yeah, we, we have downloaded this file. We, you can see we have this uh, POM XML, the same POM XML that we currently have in our project. Uh, yeah. So it has this uh, Postgres driver. It has this Reddit. Uh, driver and uh, like it generally have uh, it generally has like the spring spring framework uh data into it uh what it does this spring initializer thing that we have like start spring spring.io uh it just generates generally generates this pom file like these dependencies uh clauses so then you could paste it into this intellij idea thing this ide and press this uh, button like this circular button so it would actually download all of these libraries so what the spring initializer does is it it does not generate all of these libraries but it does generate the text which you can use to download these libraries automatically okay yeah let me check whether there are any more questions mm. okay yeah uh, moving on so uh, let's recap a bit at, at the current moment in, in time we have downloaded all of the uh like all of the dependencies that we would need <laughs> even more so we have downloaded the mongodb uh, mongodb uh, dependency and uh, right now we we are gonna start our application like start developing our application like th this uh over the developed application let's just pretend that it doesn't exist um and uh, initially we just need our postgres and redis well what we do have is we have this uh text file that i told you uh, about uh, before uh, you can see this there is a word docker in it it's just the name of a file but it it is actually used in docker uh and let's see its content so uh this is a yaml file uh yaml stands for yet another markup language uh very original uh very post ironic um and generally we already see like postgres here and we see like 16.0 16.0 is actually a version of postgres uh and uh, like most of it doesn't matter what we have uh right now uh we also have redis here and it also has some version 
So generally, it is uh, reasonable to assume that this Docker file uh, having these contents actually says, uh, well, download Postgres 16.0, do something with it. Uh, not very important right now. Then download, download this version of Redis and do something with it as well. And pretty much generally, that's what Docker does. Um, instead of us installing Postgres, then installing Redis, we can just like, and then installing MongoDB, and then installing Nginx, and then installing all of the hundred of other uh, buzzwords that you would uh, <laughs> that you would need to to pass an interview. Um, we just have to install one application, this Docker application, again, which uh, is not exclusive to Ubuntu OS, which can be installed on Mac and Windows and uh, all of the other operating systems, which is it is supported for as well. And then we just write this text file and it would itself download Postgres for us and download Redis for us. Uh, let's see a bit how it works. Uh, -da -da. Yeah, so I already have it launched. Let me just kill it yeah it kind of feels bad to forget your own password okay um so we have docker right this docker command i have it installed so i can write docker and it will not just print an error uh currently i have such things called as Docker containers uh, in my operating system. And Docker containers, if you remember, is just mini computers, mini operating systems that uh, this Docker thing has launched in my computer. So let's see which of them I have right now. Uh, Docker print state. I write this command Docker print state. Um, of course. Yeah, and as you can see, there is nothing. Currently, there are no mini computers run in my uh, on my computer. Well, uh, you you might acknowledge that is it is somehow connected to I to to me actually writing down here and it actually killing something like saying removing Docker uh, Redis, removing PostgreSQL uh, DB. <laughs> well, of course, it is connected. Good, uh, good note. And uh, now we would want to actually start back this Postgres uh, image and uh, this Redis image. So like they would be actually actual containers. So uh, our like my current laptop would have uh, several other uh, mini operating systems launched into it. Actually, the containerization, like th this process of creating con containers, works differently than just starting like another operating system in uh, your computer but that's unrelated to the topic of our discussion we're trying not to get overwhelmed that's why we're trying to uh, talk in most simple terms like as possible even at the price of uh, a bit of a technical uh, in inconsistency we just need to understand the material uh, to actually learn something not to just be demoralized and overwhelmed so um, let's see Let's look at this com command that I was uh, writing, uh, sudo. Well, because my PC makes me do that. Uh, then this Docker, and then uh, hyphen compose. We'll talk about it a bit later. Then minus f uh, is just a path to the file on my operating system. Uh, and then I wrote down. There is an alternative to write up. And uh, well, as you can probably understand, down kills containers, up creates them. Uh, so about this Docker Compose thing, uh, generally, if you would ju use just Docker command as you see here, like you can use files as well, but they are pretty ugly. Docker Compose allows us to actually have it structured like this and uh, readable. That's why I use Docker Compose, but pretty much you can achieve everything you can with Docker Compose with just this Docker command. So uh, we will refer to them as equals uh, in, in, in this conversation. OK, so let's try it out. You, we have this Docker command. We have uh, pointed it to, the, to this file, which has Postgres and Redis. And we write up. 
what it's gonna do. Okay, let's see. Yeah, as you can see, we have this Redis one, we have this PostgreSDB. One note, this uh, container name PostgreSDB is, is exactly like that. And I do not have a container name for this Redis. That's why it's uh, calling it defaultly, Redis one. Yeah, so let's see the logs. Uh, the... <laughs> you see how logs are important already here, because like if this Redis thing, if this Postgres thing did not have any logs, we wouldn't know if something went wrong. Like imagine we just like, we just would have like this empty screen. Like we would not know like if Postgres crashed, if there are problems launching them, like uh, Redis and Postgres, how can we fix them? That's why logging is very important. And that's why we actually have it in our application as well. Uh, yeah, so Redis writes, yada, 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 ready to accept connections. That's great. It launched successfully. Postgres, uh, <laughs> you can already see here, like Redis is more lightweight and like that's why it is more likely to launch faster. Uh, Postgres uh, says, yada, 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 the database system is ready to accept connections. Um, and uh, as you can, like, as, as I've already told, and you can understand, both Redis and Postgres are persistent solutions. So we can store data in it. Why would we need two? Why would we need both of them? Why can't we just use Postgres? Uh, <laughs> good question. Uh, let's see this last slide. What we have here is general top of the line differences, uh, like, between Postgres and Redis. Uh, both of them provide options for persistence. Uh, both of them can be distributed over like a million hosts. Uh, if you have like a lot of load, for example, like if you are on a scale of Google and uh, like how, how uh, a quick uh, side note, how is this relevant to you? Uh, like you, if, if you're thinking you're not going to launch a company on a scale of Google, you can get employed into Google. And uh, generally, this big tech, like best companies with best conditions, uh, they have all of the problems that uh, uh, like the distributed system requires. So if, if you are targeting for like a big tech company, uh, it's quite important to understand like these problems that you yourself, if you would be just writing uh, software for a small company, you wouldn't just have like a problem that you would have a million requests per seconds. RPS is uh, like uh, is uh, decipher deciphered to requests per seconds. Uh, it's the uh, uh, and not not an agram. I forgot the word. Like when you put just the first letters. Okay, so both uh, of the systems uh, provide uh, options for persistence. Both of the systems provide options. For for like being distributed over a lot of hosts to handle larger loads. Uh, but the difference comes in the general response time. Uh, Postgres is more of a uh, hard handling system. It uh, provides an option for really complex, really difficult, uh, for example, analytics queries where you would have like <clears throat> 10 tables across a database and you would need to join all of them together to get uh, some cumulative, uh, very large response uh, that can take hours. Postgres is good at that. And uh, that makes it slow uh, for, the, for the reason generally that uh, it uh, has more insight into its own data and has more control over it. <clears throat> On the other hand, Redis uh, is good for another use case. Redis uh, handles simple queries better uh, and uh, can withstand uh, a huge load. But that comes with a price of uh, not being too insightful about its own data and uh, not being able to actually handle uh, something really difficult. You would need like to write your own uh, solution in uh, some programming language, for example, in Java, uh, if, if you would need some uh, huge analytics over uh, data stored in Redis. So there are general differences in uh, these persistent systems. And uh, one, one important note, uh, like this pattern like is shown everywhere in, in programming it is shown in like coding interviews it is shown in system design interviews it actually shown in uh, in a workplace uh, and a lot a lot of parts more uh, there there is usually not one best answer for all of the scenarios so as you can see like uh, both redis and postgres they have their merits and they have their disadvantages as well uh, so depending on your use case 
you would uh, want to use either Postgres or Redis. And let's think a bit about what's the best use case for Redis. Like the first that would come to mind, uh, uh, like discussing it. It is uh, uh, pretty dumb, but it is pretty quick. So if you would have like some complex query that is launched in Postgres, and then not to waste a lot of resources, you would cache the result of a query in Redis. That would be quite a, use, quite a good use case. And that's what we are going to do in our application uh, that we're going to discuss uh, just right now. Uh, let me check whether there are questions right now. Yeah, uh, at this point, there are none. OK. Um, so talking about our application, uh, we have a starting point of our application. And uh, generally, uh, most of Java applications, they start with public static void main. This is our case as well. Um, a lot of what is written here is irrelevant. We need to understand that uh, this is pretty much a boilerplate code. You have, uh, as you can see, this, this exact uh, class name. Um, you have this library code that we have downloaded through Maven. And uh, we start uh, our application, like we just use the run method. Uh, one important thing to uh, get, uh, not to get over overwhelmed, you can see this. Uh, two annotations, Spring Boot application and REST controller. You put this first one on the actual application that is runnable, which is, which has the main method on, on the class. And this REST controller thing is actually used to uh, define the HTTP handles. <clears throat> As you can see, this get mapping, and there are also post mappings uh, in our application. Uh, you can see the REST controller annotation here is as well. Uh, so this handle, like th this method, allows us to get post requests. <clears throat> uh, this method allows us to get, get uh, to answer to get requests for this path. So uh, generally, you do not need to write any of the networking code yourself. You just use the annotations. If you want uh, to answer post requests, you use the post request, like the post mapping annotation. If you want to answer uh, by some path, if you want to answer the get request, you write the get mapping. Uh, I think there are also like put mapping, delete mapping, let's say. Yeah, there is a delete mapping. Uh, there is a put mapping. And generally, uh, all of the HTTP uh, types of requests, like post, get, put, delete, etc. like there is a notation for all of them. So the way to work with it is quite simple. You have your favorite method. For example, right here, it's like the post method. And you just uh, have some class. You put rest controller annotation on it. And uh, by this path, now you have some Java code that will be running. Yeah. So then uh, we have, as you can see, the student class. It's our model. We have students and schools, pretty much. Our database uh, contains two tables, school table, student table. Uh, very simple, just uh, for, for the sake of this example. Uh, the school only has the school name and the country. And students, uh, they have uh, their login. Uh, they have their school, which is a foreign key to school table. <coughs> and um, name and age. Uh, just uh, the uh, columns, they are there just to, to, <laughs> to distract you because they are insignificant. OK, so we have this uh, class with main method. We have some boilerplate code, like this REST controller. Then we have, uh, on the path of student, uh, we have the post mapping. Uh, and let me just show you this uh, curl requests. Curl is the utility to uh, send some data uh, for for some path. And as you can see, there is this post uh, word. There is this get word. It's a way to uh, actually trigger these methods that we 
<clears throat> have over here. So we have this post mapping, mapping, we have get mapping, and uh, they are corresponding. So we have the path student login. The get method would have the path student, and well, this is the login of a student. They have chosen such a such <clears throat> such a discussing login. Uh, so the post would be the same. That's the path. That's the post method, and uh, then we actually have some uh, data that is actually being sent to this post uh, request. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, what What else do we have in this uh, Java application? We have uh, some boilerplate configuration to uh, communicate with Redis. Uh, so gen generally. Uh, no uh, in-depth thought in this uh, class, as you can see. It's just uh, uh, an interface that uh, will be used by this uh, Spring system to uh, actually create a way to communicate with Redis. Uh, we have such a, such a class for student. We have such a class for school. So we only have these two models, uh, and therefore we make uh, the application uh, communicate with Redis uh, saving students, saving schools. OK, so yeah, we have this uh, class with a lot of uh, with a lot of SQL code. Um, the idea here, as you can see, is just to insert student. Uh, and like there is like login name, etc. Uh, we like inserting a school that is only name and uh, country, then we are um, getting uh, student, uh, then we're getting school. Uh, and uh, these two methods, we'll talk about them a bit later. Uh, a bit about getting school and student. Uh, we just try to get it. If we don't find it, like we, we found nothing, we just throw an exception. OK. Uh, also, there is this Redis configuration. It's I just copied it from a tutorial because uh, it is all boilerplate and uh, okay. I've put no thought into it. In a sense, I've made sure it worked. But there is uh, like a, a lot of setting this up is uh, just uh, pasting a code from uh, some source or just. Uh, for example, if you are setting up a database, uh, you just copy the information uh, from like wh where your database is set up. Let me, yeah, data source properties. For example, like uh, localhost is my computer, and this uh, port five four three two is uh, if you look like right here, um, like. This is this exact uh, 5432 port. Yeah. So uh, just copying all of this, and pretty much uh, the same thing with configuration. Uh, we have this local host port. We have, excuse me, we have a local host. We have this uh, port number, uh, like 6379. As you can see, this 6379 here as well. Um, yeah. And uh, for Postgres, we have this uh, application properties file. Uh, we also have pretty much the same thing that is written like right here. Uh, Localhost uh, 5432 and the uh, user and the uh, password is the, the other defaults, Postgres. Uh, also, like if you are listening and, and watching attentively, you can see like there are like this is the same thing. User, password, uh, database, uh, and this is this is the way to populate the database initially, like the in, do the init migration. But this is quite irrelevant to what we are talking about right now. So uh, the username Postgres, uh, password Postgres, uh, and uh, this is the name of the database, which was also Postgres. Yeah. So this is the boilerplate configuration. Um, if you would want me, I can load all of this uh, to uh, my GitHub. And also, there are like similar projects at my GitHub, which you can check out. Uh, the, the, my login is like uh, like this. Uh, I'll send it into chat. Uh, if anybody would want to look it up, uh, no problem.
I'm going to have uh, GitHub repo ring for this project. Oh, wow. Like this, this, uh, this is exactly the uh, question that I was answering right now. Like, I, and I didn't look at it. Uh, yes, definitely yes. Uh, if the like, if there is a demand for it, I will load it up. Uh, right now, uh, like this is my login. Uh, it is not uh, on GitHub. I will load it up. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's uh, move a bit further. Uh, let's look at the actual meat of uh, our uh, project. Like all of this was configuration. Uh, and generally, like uh, this, uh, uh, th the models classes are like we have this uh, Redis annotation, which uh, allows this uh, class to be stored in Redis. We have this uh, Redis ID annotation, uh, like uh, not necessarily Redis annotation, but it is used by Redis to have something as uh, the primary key, the ID key. Uh, but generally, Apart from this weird construction, which is called roadmap or uh, row mapper, uh, everything else is very simple. Like the constructor, uh, simple constructor, the simple to string, and the getters and setters. Uh, same for student. Uh, uh, there are more fields in that, but also this Redis annotation, the ID annotation for Redis to use something as ID, and uh, I'm using the user's login as ID. Um, Students login, uh, simple constructor, simple um, getters and setters. Uh, again, this weird row, row mapper construction, simple to string. Um, and I think it's time to talk about this row mapper, construct, uh, row mapper uh, construction. So uh, this uh, get requests in our database, what do they actually entail? How do they work? Uh, as you can see, well, we query for like we are selecting all from a uh, student where like where login is something uh, but what is actually returned here like this uh, like what does this query return uh, well if we look a bit deeper into it uh, the query cannot return the java object itself it just doesn't know how to uh, get this sequence of fields from the database and map it to an actual Java object. And that's exactly why we need a row mapper. Let's look at the row mappers implementation. So we <clears throat> we get this uh, result set, which is called RS, which is pretty much just a set of uh, uh, rows from the database. Uh, in our case, the table is student. So a set of uh, uh, rows which represent students. Uh, and like this is an unused field, but we get it anyway. Okay, so and then what we do is uh, we create a new object of student using this uh, result set. So we pretty much get string called login, get string called name, school, and age. And uh, like the, impor <clears throat> the important thing here is, see, this these are exactly the same names uh, as the columns so if i would like uh, write here like another name student name it wouldn't work uh, it need to match exactly the same and it does also you can see this h column uh, its type here uh, is integer and uh, we need to use another method which is called uh, get int uh, because again this result set it just uh, it is just a hash map that uh, by some uh, key, for example, by key login, has a string, which is uh, the login of the student. Uh, but it does not have any inherent knowledge, inheritant knowledge uh, about how to map this row into the actual object of student. And one actual insight is that we could have like selected, for example, only a login here, not, not all. But we could have selected only login, and then this hash map, which we uh, which we are using in this row mapper, like this result set, which is getting returned, it would only have login, uh, because the actual SQL query, the, like the rows returned, that there would be only one column. Yeah. So this is an actual lesson about why we need row mapper, because inherently there can be like a million ways to actually transform the resulted data into uh, the object of student and uh, the our application does not know how to do that uh, by itself so we need to tell it 
and we do tell it in this row mapper. Yes. So this is the way that we are working with Postgres. We just put data into it, and then we get data from it. And uh, we have this student service. This is this REST controller service. So pretty much the handle named student uh, is uh, like for triggering this create student, which we, we have just seen. And then we have this handle called get student, which is uh, a bit more complicated. We'll get into it later. Uh, but generally, uh, like this get student method is called, let's just look right into it. Just this same exact method that uh, tries to find uh, a student by login. If it doesn't find it, it throws an exception. Uh, student with login not found. Uh, and if it does find it, it just returns it. OK, so well, pretty much that's all what you have. Pretty much uh, apart from this uh, testing method, we only have a way to store student and we have a way to get student. But why would we need Redis if Postgres does it all right? Well, as I said, uh, Redis is usually used for caching. So a good practice would be uh, if we have some data that is not getting changed. And as you can see, we do not have any handle to update the data. Uh, we could just store it in this uh, fast <laughs> in this fast and furious storage called Redis, and just not to load our uh, strong but slow Postgres uh, with actually unnecessary requests. So let's see what's actually happening in this get student method. Uh, we have this student Redis repository. We try to find an actual user stored by login. If it's present, we use this logging to just uh, log out that, yes, student is found. And we just return it from Redis. Well, then, if it's not found, we log out not found on Redis. We'll try to find it in Postgres. Uh, we get the actual student from actual Postgres. And uh, if it's not found, we return now. Uh, if uh, if, if it is found, we actually return the student. So as you can see, if we have a cached student, like the first line of defense is Redis. If we have a student in Redis, we just do not need to use Postgres at all. So we remove the load from Postgres, which really can get overloaded, on, and we move it onto Redis. But well, that's all good. One question remains. How does data get into Redis as well, uh, at all, uh, not as well at all? Because as you can see in this create student method, well, there is nothing that would mention Redis. Uh, we just don't store anything in it. Well, apart from the actual code in this, our main method, and remember, uh, most and Hours as well. Java application starts with a main method. So whatever is written here will be executed uh, at the start of the program. And we have this cache loader thing. Uh, this context, you can imagine this context is like just a bag with classes, like a bag with classes that uh, are annotated like bean, that are annotated like REST controller. So uh, at the start of the application, the spring, it just creates all of these classes and puts them into this bag. And we can get like a bean from the bag called cache loader. Uh, this is actually a class that I wrote. Let's see what's happening into it. We have this one method that I wrote uh, to actually load all of the students and all of the schools. And we use Redis repositories to save them all. So that's how we actually are filling our cache at the very start of every application, uh, like our application. At the very start of our application, uh, we get all of the entities pretty much from our database, the students, the schools, and we load them into Redis. And that's the first thing that happens. Then 
some people are trying to request some students uh, trying to request like they can't request schools because I haven't implemented that handle, but they could, but they could. Uh, so they request students. And if the student exists, we uh, check Redis and just return from Redis as genius. <clears throat> also another thing, well, as uh, we only have this uh, Postgres code to actually save users in Postgres as it runs, uh, with each save, there will be more users in Postgres, which means uh, on the next start of the application, Redis will get more users itself as well. And the cache will be better. The cache hits will happen more often. Uh, in real practice, you would probably want to store uh, the users into Redis as well, not just uh, to use users use Redis to fill it up on the start of the application. But in this example, we do that as well. And uh, I thought it would be, would be kind of interesting to see how at the very beginning, uh, Redis is almost empty. And uh, then the more uh, students uh, get into it. So we will see how this application works right now. Uh, first, let me check if there are any questions. Uh, none. Nice. So uh, let's see that. OK. Yeah, started in the debugger. And uh, initially, let me just show you that uh, like the actual HTTP requests work. Uh, I have this uh, repeat string how many times, uh, like the dummy method, as you can see, like this Java code is just uh, repeats string uh, how many times. Uh, but that's uh, a good example, like to see that uh, the entire thing, like without any persistence level, layer, without anything, that it works. Uh, we have this uh, repeat uh, curl request, uh, and we need a terminal. Like I've pressed this button. You like if you're using some other ID, you might have uh, something else. But like uh, you might have this button in somewhere else. But it's just like it's called a terminal. We can just use this. Uh, default uh, Ubuntu terminal as well. Uh, so we paste uh, this request. Of course, we get some unnecessary symbols. Oh, yeah, and you can see uh, I've put this breakpoint right here. And like my current execution is in the actual code. So uh, the point is like, <sighs> That's how you put your code into an actual web application. Uh, you do some uh, decorations uh, around it. Uh, for example, this get mapping, and you use the Spring framework. But at the very end, uh, the execution will be in your own code. So let me just uh, open the evaluator. Um, and what we can see, like, we can see what the parameter we have sent, like str, uh, like one, two, three. We can see the number of times like five, uh, we can actually run any code. For example, I can just uh, replace the str uh, like this thing. Yeah. And now, like, you see, I've triggered this method with the str one, two, three, but I will get a resulting value quite different from that. Yeah, so I have uh, this string, like the, the one that I've put in the, the evaluator, uh, changed and it repeated five times. Yes, yeah, so this uh, first part about uh, actually putting our Java code in a place where HTTP requests can get it, it works. Let's see if uh, the database uh, layer works. So we have this student service. And uh, what do we have in this data? Uh, like. We only have two students, like my login and this uh, Lala dude. <laughs> uh, let's uh, put a breakpoint right here. And uh, on the get side, let's, let's put a breakpoint right here, right here, uh, right here, and right here. OK, so let's create some students. Uh, we have this curl request. Uh, let's do that again from the terminal. So I, I think it's very important to see that your actual like requests, your actual launches that you're doing, they are triggered from some other place than this IDE. Like it's it's not that you need this IDE to 
make your application work. I'm literally using the default terminal and all of this works. Like uh, it's not connected. Uh, it's not like the IDE empowers my written application to work. It's that it is already written and I can use different parts of uh, my operating system to uh, see its effect. So this curl, yeah, as you can see, we are thrown back into our uh, Java application. Uh, we create student. Uh, let's see a bit deeper what it entails. Yeah, so we just, I am pressing F9 to move forward. We will just trigger this uh, request, like request to the database. We triggered it. Uh, I'm, I'm pressing like this console thing to see if I have any exceptions here. I don't. And in terminal, uh, yeah, like this is like this number one that I'm having here. Uh, it just means that the insert has, has been successful. Let's see. Students, yes, we have this uh, third dude called Sergey. Okay, <laughs> somewhere age fifty-one. Oh, not a... school is not the best place for him. Okay, so uh, that works. Let's try to get uh, our student right now. Uh, let's try to get some student that has already been saved. And uh, as you can see, well, we had logging uh, in our cache loading. So we had lo loading to cache schools and students. So uh, we have these logs right here, these two logs. So all of the students that were loaded are this like me <laughs> and this Lala dude. So uh, my prediction is uh, if we try to query for myself, we will get it from cache. But if we try to uh, query for this new dude, this uh, ABC dude, we will not get him from cache and we will have to go forward uh, towards uh, the end like of the code that we have in this student class let's try it out uh, okay cool uh, yeah this is like getting the student uh, let's just get some unexisting student initially just to see that code fails uh, wait a sec Let's go. Yes. Yeah, so we have entered this uh, get mapping method. Method. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So we moving forward. We got something from Redis, but we got an optional empty. So this user doesn't exist. Move forward. Uh, we have written out what? Written out nothing yet. Now we have written that uh, the student with this name does not exist in Redis. Uh, we'll try Postgres. We are going into full Postgres. Uh, like when, when I see such a window, I just press accept. So it doesn't really matter what was written there. And we are getting that exception student with long lip not found. As you can see, like we even have the stack trace. Like uh, the initial call like, started from this get student method, then it went somewhere down the line. Then it entered like this throw new runtime exception. And that's right, because we don't have such a user. Let's now try uh, myself. Uh, the person I love the most. Uh, yeah. Let's go. Um, yeah, from Redis. Yeah. Here we got the student because it was there, like optional, actually not empty right now and containing something. Uh, student, like the, the log we are going to write right, right now, like student wolf is found in Redis. And we are just going to return it. And what did we get in this terminal? We. Mm, kind of got nothing. <laughs> Wait a sec. Um, let me check it out. Okay, let's let's try one more time. Uh, did we? Uh, we just uh, wrote it in a different terminal. Yeah. So yeah, uh, all's right. We just got myself right here, uh, written as a string. Okay. So let's now try this student ABC that we've uh, only added uh, at the at the run runtime. 
of this application after the caches were initialized. So, yeah, we uh, the login we were using ABC uh, going forward. Uh, got it from Redis. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it from Redis. Okay, wait a sec. Um, do you have to restart the application? I'm I'm getting a bit lost with tag. Yeah, one option what happened is like um, it just got cached. But let me just restart. Try to uh, save another non-existent student. And uh, like w one point that I wanted to mention is like, look, uh, now we have uh, this log about students being loaded in the cache. We have like Mike, we have this Lala, and we have the ABC. So uh, at the very start, the code like the entities get sent into Redis. Let me uh, try to post uh, a student named uh, BBB. Okay. Yeah, got inserted. And now let's get BBB uh, in the same terminal. Corals. Okay. Yeah, you see, now we're getting the optional empty. And well, we will try to get it from Postgres. And uh, in like in actual Postgres, we did get the student that we have just saved. Uh, my guess uh, about what just happened, why ABC uh, was uh, returned, uh, like Spring does some internal caching itself. So uh, we have spent some time, like almost one minute uh, before actually saving the ABC dude and uh, trying to query, it might have uh, cached already. Uh, but uh, as you can see, like the actual uh, answer without uh, like any, any uh, shenanigans that we have not implemented ourselves is that uh, we do have this BBB guy, the, the last one that we queried, uh, but we only have it in uh, Postgres and uh, the Redis um did not have it because we just did not save it but but if we just relaunch the application right now uh we would have this log as you can guess about loading uh, to cache and we have this bbb guy as well yeah so uh this is one of the applications of redis uh, to use it as cache uh, going a bit for, uh, further redis uh, uh, actually also has other applications uh for example uh, blob storage. It has a, a lot of modules. So for example, uh, quick searches for text, uh, similar to how the Elasticsearch does things. But uh, generally, yeah, here's the example of uh, an actual application that we uh, only had two things. Uh, we had the ID, this like this screen that I'm sharing right now. Uh, we had uh, our Docker installed. And then everything uh, from there, it went uh, like we just had text files. We just had text files that we have implemented ourselves. Yeah, uh, I will most definitely uh, save this uh, project uh, on my GitHub, uh, the login I've given you. Uh, so um, let, me, let me just uh, ch check right now if this is indeed my GitHub. Uh, home, home. Uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, it is is gonna appear there uh, in like uh, in a couple of hours. So uh, let me check if there are any more questions. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, given the link to GitHub to the uh, to the chat, and the question is: so if I understand this information, we saved are uh, actually saved to the uh, databases uh, in Docker container uh, you have launched. If you run the containers uh, down now, we'll lose access to the data. Good question, good question. Yeah, th thank you for listening attentively. Uh, the answer uh, to your question is, uh, like there are two parts of it. Uh, is it uh, saved to the databases that are launched uh, in 
uh, Docker yes, the answer is yes. And uh, the answer to the question where whether we are going to lose data or not is actually no, because uh, if we look uh, uh, at this Docker file, uh, there is this thing that is uh, like uh, PG data, the thing that I told you not to worry about, but like its actual use is uh, to have this. Uh, uh, Excuse me, not not, not like uh, PG data as as well, but uh, uh, like this uh, this you see like this Postgres data like and there is this folder Postgres data. Uh, let me uh, reload from disk. Uh, yeah, somehow it doesn't appear. So like uh, the idea is that uh, like this uh, PG data. Uh, is uh, going to be mounted like as volume. This Postgres data folder is going to be mounted as volume, and uh, thanks to it, we are not going to lose uh, uh, the data if we relaunch our database. So uh, let's actually see this in practice, uh, as like uh, as we have a bit of more time, I guess. Mm, yeah, we have um, uh, the uh, the Docker Compose file run here. Down. So yeah, the, initially we only had two students. So uh, the, the hope is if we just uh, like we have downed it, and now we will up it, and we will have uh, more, like uh, more than two, in the database. Uh, yes, yeah, as, as you can see, it, it was persisted. Uh, let me just uh, for, for for the uh, like uh, more vivid show like down it. Uh, yeah, now we can't connect to the database, but this Postgres data, like uh, my ID is somewhat does not uh, show it up, but uh, the idea is this mounting of a volume allows us to actually persist uh, it on disk. Um, yeah, so yeah, answering your question uh, is uh, uh, thanks to uh, having this uh, and variable PG data and actually mounting the local uh, folder like this local folder Postgres data uh, to this uh, PG data, we can uh, have uh, the database be pers persistent between uh, the downs and ups of uh, actual containers. Yeah, let, let me just show you the containers as well, like uh, Docker PS, uh, print state, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we have these two containers, like one this Postgres DB, one this Docker Redis one with the default name. Uh, if we down it, uh, this ps command would print nothing. Yeah, there is nothing. Like the containers are down, like they are written down. So if if we wouldn't have the persistence, uh, like the next launch would uh, just kill all of, all the data. So yeah, we we don't have anything. Uh, Now we up it. Uh -huh, yeah, and uh, yeah, now we are connecting and have all of them, uh, except just having like uh, this uh, Lala and Woofless, we have uh, all four users. So yeah, answer, answering your questions, uh, that's it. Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody for your attention. Uh, that was uh, a lot more time than uh, I planned, like twice as long. Uh, but hopefully you learned something from it. And uh, the code that we've written right now, I'm going to uh, post to, to my GitHub. Um, that was uh, quite an interesting experience. I thank you all for being here. Uh, if you have any last questions, uh, please ask them right now. Uh, I'll wait for like one minute. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess uh, the event passed. Uh, if you have very any questions uh, afterwards, uh, like I have the same login on Telegram, so you can uh, hit me up. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you, and uh, have a good one.